Glory to Jesus Christ. And we're reading the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And that's what it looks like if you want to look it up on Amazon or something. And this is the second edition by Libreria Editucci Vaticana. That's the Vatican bookstore and publishing house. And it was published in 2016, the second edition. And you can get it online at www.vatican.va, Catechism of the Catholic Church. There's a PDF drive and a download for that. And USCCB slash resources slash catechism, Catechism of the Catholic Church. So you can find it. And then you follow the numbers. As I say, the most important number would be 461. And getting it. So let's pray in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. O heavenly King, comforter, spirit of truth, who are everywhere present and filling all things, O treasury of blessings and giver of life, come dwell within us and cleanse our souls, O gracious Lord. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. So this is on the incarnation. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. God, the eternal word, the second person of the Trinity, took on himself the fullness of our nature and uh, materiality, our body and everything like that. But as we talked about yesterday with the, uh, for Act 5 from the Council of Chalcedon and of 451, distinct, the two distinct natures, not mixed together, not crushed together, not uh, eliminated, uh, not uh, the human, not eliminated, that's the Eutychian, Eutychian heresy, but that uh, full, both full and, and integral in themselves, but Jesus is one person. So there's no separation or division in Christ either, as paradoxical as that seems. But uh, everything about the eternal and the infinite is paradoxical from our perspective. So taking up, this is 461, taking up St. John's expression, the word became flesh. The church calls incarnation the fact that the Son of God assumed a human nature in order to accomplish our salvation in it. In a hymn cited by St. Paul, the church sings the mystery of the incarnation. That's from uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God. There he is, equality with God. So he's not of like substance to the Father, he is the same substance. He's equal to the Father, which means not only that he's he's God, God with a capital G, because some people sort of had a graded God, the you know the uh, the highest God, then a higher God, a lower God, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, going on. Uh, that tends to be polytheism, but also there were some that sort of had a pantheistic sort of thing like that and uh, drawing from Neoplatonism, but uh, that there was the one, and then there were these emanations from the one. Uh, but no, uh, God the Word is equal to, the, to God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit is equal to God the Father. Do not deem equality with God a thing to be grasped at, to cling to, but emptied himself, that's the kenosis, the uh, emptying, self-emptying of Christ, taking the form of a servant, that means being fully human, being born in the likeness of men. So in Jesus Christ, I came to serve and not to be served. So he's in our human likeness, but not just an appearance of that, but of the full reality, fully human. In fact, he's the one who's fully human. And we're all defective in our humanity, but he isn't in that. So but we will be restored in the resurrection in a body and all that. 
the, the reality of heaven, a, a complete restoration, and beyond that, we'll experience the uh, divinizing power of God's grace, the transforming power, the sanctifying power. So, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, so obeying death, with uh, personifying death in this, this case, that uh, which accepted the fullness of our mortal humanity and stuff. Like some people think, oh, Jesus never had an illness or anything. I think he had all the common things that were going down the pike, you know, all the childhood illnesses, all the other things. That's, of course, total speculation. By part, but that would make sense if he's emptying himself of his glory and taking on himself our full condition, the struggle of our condition. 462. The letter to the Hebrews refers to the same mystery. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you take no pleasure. Then I said, lo, I have come to do your will, O God. And that's uh, Hebrews 10, 5 to 8, citing Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8, or 7 through 9 in the Septuagint. The, that's the, I want, it's, um, that's a diff, uh, the Greek edition that, uh, Jesus usually quotes from. Oh, he probably quoted quoted the scripture in Aramaic, but he, uh, but in the New Testament, it's always just about always, but not always, just about always from the Septuagint, the quote unquote Catholic canon of the uh, the Bible, the full canon. And uh, so, belief in the true incarnation of the Son of God is the distinctive sign of Christian faith. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit which confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. First John 4, 2. So those who are denying the incarnation uh, uh, do not know the Spirit of God, at least in that area. And every good spirit, angels and the like, would confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Yeah. Such is the joyous conviction of the church from her beginning, whenever she sings the mystery of our religion. He was manifested in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16. So let's look at the commentary from... In the uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church, with theological commentary uh, edited by Archbishop Rino Finiscella and published by Our Sunday Visitor in 2019. 2019. So on page 744, this commentary is by Vincenzo Battaglia. The Son of God became man. The object of this is treatment of the multiple salvific aspects of the mystery of the incarnation. Because that it's through the incarnation that the, as I said, the multiple aspects of salvation uh, come forth through the incarnation that God took on himself this. So as the fathers of the church would say, uh, that which is not taken up is not saved. So our bodies are saved by the incarnation, by he, he became that. And of course, he, the saving death and resurrection, the culmination of incarnation and the death and resurrection. The response to the question of why God became man, a question that is always relevant and more so today than in the past, is summarized in four essential statements that make it possible to gather the multiple aspects of the soteriological, that's about salvation and the savior, narrative into a single square, as it were. First, reconciliation with God. 
which involves the redemptive purpose of the event of the incarnation. Then the revelation and gift of God's love in its definitive form, which is the incarnation and then you know, the, the showing us the way by his death and resurrection and becoming and being the way as God, the way, the truth, and the life. Third, there is the foundational reference to Jesus Christ as the model of holiness. So he's not only our way of holiness and the truth of holiness and the life of holiness, he is our model for holiness. He's our model for just about everything dealing with the spiritual. And uh, he's a true model. Like Mohammed, Mo, uh, Muslims take Mohammed as their model, but he's not a very good one. Uh, but Jesus is an, the excellent model. Inasmuch as the life of disciples requires commitment to following and imitating him, so it's not enough to believe in him. We have to make the commitment of imitating him in, uh, in, uh, in the what would Jesus do sort of thing. So it goes in the different circumstances that we're in. You know, so, uh, St. Charles de Foucault, he, or is he blessed? I can never remember if he got canonized or not. But anyway, uh, Charles de Foucault, who had a... a a, a, a dramatic conversion experience in, in adulthood. He was baptized, confirmed Catholic, but he had uh, lived a life of dissipation. Uh, and um, he had this conversion experience and he wanted to imitate Christ, literally. So he wanted to go to, to uh, Nazareth and live in Nazareth and live in, in the poverty that he did. I think he even took up carpentry. Uh, this stuff. But that's not the imitation of Christ. It's the imitation of Christ that St. Thomas, well, the venerable Thomas Akempis uh, put forward in his book. That is uh, doing what Jesus would do in these things and imitating him, applying the teachings of Jesus and the example of Jesus in our own lives, in our own situations, in our own vocation and the like. Finally, so uh, imitating him leads to being conformed to him, which often, you know, since, uh, you know, uh, the 1960s, conforming was uh, considered a, neg a negative thing. But ironically, uh, they were demanding conforming to them. And now that they're in power, uh, they're uh, totalitarian about it. Finally, participation in the divine life by grace, by virtue of the admirable, uh, oh, it's not, not it's Latin, not English, admirabile commercium, the marvelous exchange, a participation that is configured as participation in the divine sonship of the only begotten Son of God. So we're heirs of Christ, joint heirs with Christ in that uh, participation in the divine sonship. Where, of course, ours is by adoption and his is by nature slash supernature. Uh, again, of course, it's an analogy, a father-son analogy, like speaker and word analogy, but uh, it is expressing a, an intense reality that we cannot get, you know, by really any other way but than analogy to the human, to human love. So following the assumption of our human condition, that which is not assumed is not saved, and it is saved. So we are given an introduction that leads us to read, understand, and confess the mystery of Jesus Christ. And again, mystery doesn't mean an, an enigma, it's not a... Miss Marple sort of thing, trying to uh, put a puzzle together somehow or other uh, with missing pieces. No, it's a marvel, a marvel, a, a wonder that we can participate in. But uh, it, it uh, doesn't conflict with reason, with the capital R, but transcends this, you know, because by our own human experience, material experience, we wouldn't put this all together. 
but Jesus does for us. Giving due prominence to the importance of its soteriological about concerning salvation and the Savior effect. As follows initially from the phrase placed at its beginning, for us men and for our salvation in the creed, in the middle of the creed, when they talk about the Nicene Creed. And they said, when for us men, which meaning humanity, for in, in each individual human, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, became flesh, became fully human, and of the Virgin Mary, and became man. Et incarnatus es, was incarnate. And taken from the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, that's what I just rephrased, a phrase connected, first of all, with the mystery of the incarnation. In the formula for us men and for our salvation, the preposition for, expressed in the original Greek text with dia, so uh, often these prepositions, uh, the meaning would change according to the, uh, the case ending of the word. So, uh, and in the Latin translation with propter, which can be according to as well, is found many times in the New Testament. And here in the Concilia text, the, the text of the Second Vatican Council, it basically means for our benefit, for our sake, to realize our salvation. Less obvious and somewhat in a subordinate position, there is also a third meaning, in our place. So he took everything on upon himself that we, that we could not endure as, as frail creatures. He did, in his creaturehood that he took upon himself, did as God incarnate. <coughs> Excuse me. In reflecting on the reason for the incarnation, the road to follow is to consider in a precise way the initiative which the only begotten Son of God assumed in communion with the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit, but to be able to understand the motivation for it, to know its meaning and its purpose for us men, we have no other criterion to adopt but that of the history of salvation culminating in the event of Jesus Christ, whose saving mediation is universal and embraces all time, past, present, and future, reaching out to an eschatological perspective and a protological, a first, or even preceding, in some ways, uh, perspective. So it, uh, the under, uh, the foundation of logic, <clears throat> in many ways, the book of Revelation pronounces this essential myth in lapidary form. Uh, lapidary comes from lapis, and I thought, I thought it was a collection of rocks, but uh, uh, stones, but uh, in particular, precious stones. But uh, I don't know what this means here. So, uh, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Revelation twenty three thirteen, and see Revelation one eight and twenty one six. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches, in a pellucid expression, I don't know what pellucid means, uh, that the Church calls incarnation the fact that the Son of God assumed a human nature, in order to accomplish our salvation in it. So, it's we're saved because Jesus is eternally, truly God, and from the moment of his description, truly human, and who went through our mortal condition, all that. So not only as example and inspiration, but as savior. In order to avoid the risk of thinking about the mystery of Jesus Christ in only a functional manner, this happens when we do not take account fittingly of his divine filial, that is, son, sonly, if that's a word, it's not, uh, as son, uh, identity, or fail to join it with the fact of his eternal pre-existence in God, which is not just pre-existence, but it's existence with a capital E, in God as word and only begotten son of the father. Again, the two analogies there. In the continuation of the paragraph of the doctrinal ex exposition on faith, in the true incarnation of the son of God, is given the right prominence 
it is the distinctive sign of Christian faith. So if you don't believe in the incarnation, that God, the eternal one, became fully human and all that, then you're not really Christian. And that's also true of if you reject the Trinity. That's, that's uh, true. The exposition makes use of the authoritative and decisive contribution from the history of Christological dogma, uh, 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 the highest doctrine about Christ, in the patristic era, that's the era of the fathers, from the, the, the anti-Nicene fathers from the time of the apostolic fathers from the time of the apostles, basically, to the, uh, uh, the cutoff point of the patristic era uh, has always been controversial. Some say, oh, well, uh, St. John of Damascus in the 8th century, he was the last. Others say, oh, no, uh, go up to uh, Bernard of Clairvaux or uh, in the... 12th century or uh, further on. And some in the East say, oh, well, the patristic area is still going on as long as the theologian is rooted in the fathers, in the scriptures, in the apostolic tradition. So, uh, where was I? Especially from the dogmatic formulas of the first seven ecumenical councils. So that goes, and that includes the quote-unquote icon council of, of uh, Constantinople, no, Nicaea II, excuse me, Nicaea II in 787, because that's Christological, because it says, if you can't depict Jesus as a, a human being in a, a painting, however abstracted, or whatever, or however uh, the vision is of the creativity of the artist, then you're saying he doesn't, hasn't taken on himself the fullness of uh, a human image, the fullness of a human nature, the fullness of human materiality. And uh, so, yeah, we're not ghosts. That's not our destiny. Our destiny is to be resurrected body and uh, spiritized bodies to be uh, fully liberated souls and fully liberated bodies. So we don't have a body, we are bodies. We don't have souls, we are souls. We don't have minds, we are minds. And that, but it's all one thing. We're to be a unity. And uh, that's a unity we crave for, but we don't get in this mortal existence, but we will in the resurrection. Uh, resurrection to life, that is, because there's resurrection to life and re uh, resurrection to damnation, uh, condemnation. That Saint, uh, oh, anyway, that Jesus talked about as well in John, but also in Acts. I think it's also in Acts. Um, and this... So they reject Apollinarianism, which says that Jesus didn't really, didn't really have a human soul. It, it was uh, his divine person that filled the body. So it was sort of a robot uh, manipulated by the word uh, of God, but uh, not fully human. So he didn't go through what was it. So in this docetism, it said he didn't have a body at all or it just, he had just appeared to have a body. Nestorianism, which in a classic form, which it seems Nestorius did not uphold, nor did really the Nestorian church uphold in the, the sense of what was condemned uh, at uh, Ephesus. Uh, so uh, Nestorianism, that's that there are two persons uh, and, and uh, the one Christ, and there's a division. So there's division and separation. Uh, between the two, uh, not just natures, but two persons, two separate persons, uh, and that's uh, but uh, uh, so and monophysism. That's it's, it's only one nature. So a one encountered nature of God, the Word, can mean what was uh, expressed at the Council of Chalcedon or not. And uh, the terminology often it's a battle over terminology, but. Uh, there's basically only one nature in, in Christ. And of course, then there's extreme, which turns into, 
Eutychianism that I mentioned, that uh, the humanity is uh, totally swallowed up in the infinite and eternal uh, nature and uh, person of God, of God the Word. So that's the heresy that's that. Because then again, the bridge isn't built between the... So, and uh, he has, it's in a sense play acting going through the passion and everything. So in his condition as true God and true man, fully God, fully human, and, and true, he's the true man. He, he's the measure of all, of all uh, authentic humanity. And also to the integrity and concreteness of the human nature, rational soul and body, also emotional soul and body, um, the human condition assumed by the Son of God, as regards the def definition of the divinity of Jesus made by the Council of Nicaea, that's the first council, 325. In contrast, it is given only a single numbered item in number 465. Given the numerous difficulties which many find in understanding and then accepting this truth of the fullness of the incarnation, which is the central datum of the faith, that's the singular of data, data, uh, fact, of the faith handed on by the apostles. I think it useful to propose, this is, this is uh, Vincenzo here, Battaglia, whom I'm uh, there saying, uh, I think it useful to propose a little more detailed explanation of the Nicene Creed, so to meditate on the Nicene Creed. And I also encourage people to meditate on the Ath Athanasian Creed as, as well, of that which is fuller creed, which you can find online, just Athanasian Creed. There are archaic translations, and there are more modern translations of that uh, Athanasian Creed, which is an an ecumenical creed, a Western ecumenical creed. It's not embraced by the Eastern churches, but it is by the Catholic Church uh, and uh, Lutheran churches, Anglican churches, uh, various other Western churches. Of that, they, uh, I mean the Orthodox. By the Eastern, I mean the Orthodox, because uh, there's no uh, there's no Eastern cafeteria Catholicism any more than there's uh, Western cafeteria Catholicism because it wouldn't be Catholic otherwise if you leave dogmas out that you don't like or whatever or don't fit into your whatever to, uh, then you're not Catholic. That's the way. Of course, there are people who are ignorant, who are simply ignorant. That's another story. But uh, people who know better and uh, it's, I find... Uh, dishonest. Go off to the Orthodox churches, go off to what are the Protestant churches that if that's, if you're going to pick and choose when it comes to dogma and even morality. Um, I mean, the, the, the uh, espousing the morality, not because your people can be weak and not always follow the morality, but they need to repent if it's a serious sin uh, and confess it. which is the Nicene Creed as the indispensable point of reference of the other councils of the Patristic Age, and not just of the Patristic Age, all the councils, all 21 of them. In this way, we will be able to appreciate further how much the Catechism of the Catholic Church says in the items on the title of only begotten Son and Word of God. So we'll stop there for now, and uh, next time talk about the Arians a bit. Uh, and let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is truly risen. Bye now.